Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar in the QMM Best Practice Workshop of this year. Now, to introduce today's speaker. Today's speaker is Professor Yanis Mavri. He is based at the uh, University of Ljubljana, where he's a uh, professor of pharmaceutical chemistry and also at the National Institute of Chemistry in Ljubljana, where he's head of the Laboratory for Computational Biochemistry and Drug Design. Uh, so Janis uh, has a wide-ranging interest in a uh, number of areas in theoretical and computational pharmacology, as well as the application of these, of these areas for drug design and things like carcinogenesis, uh, namely multi-scale simulation of enzyme reactions, including, of course, QMM, um, as we'll no doubt uh, Janis will be talking about today, the role of hydrogen bonding, nuclear quantum effects, transport phenomena, um, and receptor triggering. Janis has been... Uh, uh, recipient of the Long-Term Human Frontier Science Program Fellowship, as well as a Fulbright Scholarship. Um, and he lectured at places like Gordon Research Conference um, and has held several visiting uh, positions at research groups at uh, universities and in Canada and uh, Netherlands and also in France. So first I would like to thank for this kind invitation. So it is, it would be much more it would be much nicer to be, I guess, in Finland, where 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 it is located. So, but we we can do it also in this way. So today I'm going to talk about multi-scale simulation of monoaminergic system, and we will have applications to neuro neurodegeneration. So I would say that fil rouge of this talk will be protons and. We all know that snow and ice is white because of the protons. So this photo is from, from Nepal a couple of years ago, and that's Amadabna. So this year, I can only dream about this. Okay. <clears throat> uh, this is my group here. So the, the photo was taken a couple of uh, years ago. So this is uh, this is with all visitors and students, and what we are doing is basically we try to understand function of biological macromolecules, and application is drug design. And since uh, proteins are large molecules, it's absolutely necessary to proceed with uh, hierarchical treatment that is called multiscale modeling. So. In December 2013, I was attending uh, Nobel Prize lectures in Stockholm, and I remember a sentence of Martin Karpler saying, if I were 30 years younger, I would be simulating the brain. Martin Karpler turned 90 last year. So I was quite happy to hear that since at that time, we already made first steps in this direction. So let's now define monominergic system. So it consists of neurons that basically secrete monomine uh, neurotransmitters such as dopamine, noradrenaline, and serotonin. So when they, they activate the receptor, it's fine to, to decompose them, and these are enzymes that, think that are monamine oxidases, catecholone methyltransferases, then transporters like dopamine transport, serotonin transporters, and receptors. So these receptors are, are actually sensors that feel over neurotransmitters. So the levels of monamines critically depend on the rate of reuptake and the rate of decomposition is of course controlled by enzymes and monamine oxida oxidases are essential enzymes to maintain the level of monoaminergic neurotransmitters. So it would be fine to understand and to simulate the rates of those of this of those enzymes from first principle. And in this case, it's fine to understand what is the physics or chemistry behind that. So Pauling rationalized that the nature of enzyme catalysis uh, is, 
is basically uh, is basically uh, based on more favorable solvation of the transition state relative to the reactants. And if this is the case, then the reaction would proceed faster. But he was more or less quiet about the nature of this of this solvation. And then Arya Warshaw recognized that, that pre-organized electrostatics is the only relevant factor for enzyme catalysis. So you can see Arya here in Blade in Slovenia. <clears throat> so pre-organized electrostatics simply means that polar and ionizable groups around the transition states are organized in a way that they stabilize transition state better than the reactor. So reversible work to reorganize or to organize those dipoles when going from reactant to the transition state is lower than the corresponding value in, in aqueous solution. So it's like that. So electrostatics is a long range interaction and it's somehow, I would somehow this gives some evidence why enzymes have to be so large. So you cannot, you cannot uh, design efficient enzyme with five residues. Okay, when the substrate starts to approach the enzyme, it, it, must, it must first find the, the active site. So this searching is usually diffusion control. And, and this cost this 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 barrier here to search active site is 5.2 kcal per mole and this corresponds to the rate constant of 10 or 10 on 9 so this is the fusion controlled reaction then they form michaelis complex and in computation enzymology we would like to calculate the the activation Free energy. So this is the basis of computational energy, uh, computational enzymology to calculate activation free energy for going from the from the Michaelis complex over the transition state to the to the well of 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 the products. So this was formulated more 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 than hundred years ago by uh, Michaelis and Mod Menten. I don't know if you. No, but Mod Menten was MD by basic education. So most of the enzymes are not, not very fast. So an average enzyme works, uh, exhibits KCAT of 10 per second. And so, but there are some, some enzymes that are very fast, like acetylcholine esterase, uh, superoxide dismutase and so on. So most of those enzymes had to be fast in order to properly to, 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 to properly catalyze the reaction. So the superoxide dismutases, catalyzes and stuff like that have to remove very fast reactive oxygen species. So this is important. So 10 per second works and is the rate constant of the average enzyme. So then let's define catalysis. Catalysis is lowering of the activation energy relative to the reference reaction. So traditionally in, in enzymology, we have reaction in aqueous solution. So uh, this is the, re uh, the reference reaction. So in the enzyme, the barrier will be, will be lower than, than the corresponding reaction in aqueous solution. And this differences is is the measure for catalysis. At this point, it's worth to, to, to give you a warning of improper models, so dynamical and other esoteric effects do not contribute to catalysis. So Judith Klinman, that basically advocated these ideas, changed her mind. So I talked a couple of years ago with Sharon Hamish Schiffer, uh, her close co, co co-worker and but it's interesting I, up to my knowledge they did not publish anything in this direction I mean that they were wrong so for the criticism you can read these papers especially illustrative is this paper of Adrian Mulholland 
stating that transition state theory is perfectly valid. Okay, now we have basically all the tools to proceed with monoamine oxidases. These are this, we are talking about two enzymes, MAOA and MAOB. They appear in the uh, gastrointestinal tract and in the central nervous systems. They metabolize serotonin, dopamine, tyramine, you know. If, if you block those by, by one of the inhibitors and eat uh, old cheese that contains tyramine, you have very, very good chance to, to, to end at the emergency medicine department. So what it does, it actually, uh, this reaction, uh, the reaction that it uh, catalyzes is basically oxidative, oxidative deamination of the, of the amines. So before, at the very end, we obtain the aldehydes, ammonia, and peroxide, and that, that further gives rise to reactive oxygen species. So, by definition, whenever a molecule of biogenic amine is, is metabolized by monoamine oxidase, you obtain a molecule of hydrogen peroxide. So that's not very good news. Since hydrogen peroxide is, 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 uh, is basically causing neurodegeneration. All right. Robert Vianella joined us as Marie Curie scholar and his knowledge of physical organic chemistry was sufficient to propose the mechanism. He was using cluster model like Bach uh, Michimon does it. So he included few residues and he, 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 he uh, examined few reaction mechanisms. And basically he, he came to the conclusion that uh, if the proto if uh, this hydride if uh, ch bond is cleaved uh, in the form of hydride this is the most favorable barrier so only 24 kk so this radical and polar nucleophilic mechanisms were much much more expensive so much higher barrier so this is not a plausible reaction channel well, we were still a little bit high, 24 kcal, experimental value is 16 kcal. And this is one of the reasons why, why uh, small enzymes are not very efficient. Then, so this is the message, reaction proceeds like that. We have a, we have methylene group, vicinal to the neutral amino group. And this is, this is, uh, this hydride is, is means hydride is the tet, so hydride ion means uh, proton plus lone pair. And flavin at the at this position and five here picks up hydride. So we have finally we appeared on the cover page of the European Journal of Organic Chemistry. We were very proud of that. And then we have machinery to then we have machinery to to include full full dimension of the, of the enzyme and the method of choice is empirical valence bond. So this is actually force field that is able to model chemical reactions, so bond breaking and bond making. So it's fine because uh, it, it includes knowledge about the reference reaction, so it could be even um, ex experimental value of, of the barrier or that gives rise to, to experimental uh, rate constant, let's say, in aqueous solution. And we have basically one or two, two or, or, or three parameters, and these parameters are transferable between aqueous solution and proteins. So actually, uh, we are talking about uh, uh, description of the reactant and the product well. And we have to we have to basically fit in this H12 that gives the that gives the 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 the, uh, the barrier height and uh, gas phase shift that is basically the difference between these two terms here. So message is now we have computational inexpensive description. Of the of the reactive system that allows for for high quality 
a thermal average. So Micha Purk actually provided this, this slide. So if you have a SN2 reaction, so two-dimensional case, this chlorine and bromine and carbon in, 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 uh, are, are linear, then um, I, I would say medium high, medium high level of activity would require 20 hours for 1,600 points. So this is uh, this is uh, roughly uh, 1.6 picosecond of molecular dynamics, huh? while empirical valence bond requires 0 0.1 seconds. So it's a big, big, big difference. So by multi-scale simulation, in, in conjunction with empirical valence bonds, one obtains well converged free energy profiles. And uh, at this point, it's worth to stress that it's essential to have the same orientation of the reactive species for the enzyme reaction and reference reaction. So this can be contrasted with the ab initio KNMM simulation, where they are typically far away from convergence still with the advent of metadynamics there is there is some progress and criticism of ab initio qmmm is that typically do, they do not have the reference reaction so within machinery we can afford very long simulations so nanoseconds so for monoamine oxidases uh, the, react, the the simulation converge, I would say, at one nanosecond, and since we, this is computationally affordable, we can we can afford even ten parallels, so to have a measure of the error bar. Okay, that's the reaction. So again, courtesy of Maestro Michael Purk, so that's the decomposition of serotonin. You can see full dimensionality of the enzyme. We have thermal averaging, and this, this CH will be cleaved, and the hydrogen will be picked up, will be picked up by, by uh, flavin nitrogen atom and five. So I'm proud since this reaction, simulation of this reaction I performed with my own hands. That was follow up of uh, learning Q5. Okay, here is the maestro. <clears throat> and I love this. I, when I was in, at the University of Southern California, I had wonderful view from my office to the Hollywood sign. Okay, here are the results. In the gas phase, the reaction will not proceed. The barrier is 35 kcal and the reaction is optimal. In aqueous solution, the barrier goes down to 28 kcal, while in the in in the protein environment we have the barrier that is perfectly comparable with the experiment. It see you see it's slightly exothermic, and that's good since the enzyme reactions may not be too exothermic since you know this is one way how the how, how they are controlled if, the, if the, the population of products is increased too much, the reaction goes back. Okay, so with, uh, by subtracting the, the barrier in aqueous solution from that one in enzyme, uh, we can see that MAOB provides 10.4 kcal to catalysis. So we here we are talking about dopamine decomposition. We simulated series of uh, of the of the substrate by by using MAOB, MAOA, and we obtained reasonable, very reasonable, and nicely uh, reasonable re reasonable values of the bears that are, that nicely compare with the experiment. So this. Serotonin that we published this year, last year is not yet in this table. Okay. This last year we also simulated uh, uh, MAOB irreversible inhibitions. You know, Parkinson patients are usually taking one of those two 
irreversible inhibitors, rastagelin, this is Israeli know-how, or selagelin, this was Hungarian know-how. And uh, we simulate that reaction and actually proceeds basically by the same by the same mechanism as the as the as uh, the enzyme catalyzes the reaction of, of the composition. That this was mainly done in by Robert and Tana Tanderich here, and this was fine work. All right. Uh, one of the strong tools in physical chemist in physical organic chemistry is is um, HD kinetic isotope effect. So this that means proton is or deuteron are no more part, uh, points but are rather clouds. So this is this is this nuclear wave function. And this can be done by on a grid, and this is the manic, but very elegant way is path integration. So instead of having one proton or some other atoms, we have a necklace that is of, let's say, of protons, 10 or 18 uh, small bits will represent the proton, and this uh, force constants depend on the mass. So um, proton is deuteron is more localized than the proton. So this is nicely implemented now in also an OPRIST Q6 package. So now let's let's try to understand that properly. Here are probability densities. So uh, classical classical probability densities is this blue one. H is more delocalized and D is somehow in between. And if you take minus KT ln probability density, we obtain different barriers for H and for D, D and the difference is the measure of kinetic isotope effect. So at this point, it's worth to mention that tunneling is not a dynamical phenomenon and is perfectly compatible with the transition state theory. So it can be calculated also by Monte Carlo methodology. No, so con concept of time is not necessary. So we basically reproduce it. This was nice work with uh, Ricardo and uh, Zen Chun. Yeah? Um, and this is not, so, so this fact that we basically reproduced the experimental value that has pre pretty pretty wide uh, span gives additional evidence about validity of the transition state theory. So this is not just blue sky research because um, recently pharmaceutical industry launched uh, deuterated drugs because they are more stable. So. If you have deuterated whatever it is, it is it is let's say 12 times 12 point 12 point eight times more stable than its hydrogen analog, and this is of course more favorable for the patients. It's, it's not not necessary to administer a drug every five hours or so, but maybe once a day. So very similar results were obtained for other substrates and by quantization of, of more atoms. Last year we managed to publish this paper and this one uh, was uh, for benzylamine. Benzylamine is the is the research uh, is the research uh, analog is this research substrate and you can see here we quantized much much more atoms. So this is snapshot from the simulation here. We quantized about more than 20 atoms, and the results were again consistent with the expert. Okay, does tunneling contribute to enzyme catalysis? One would say, you know, if it's uh, eight or 12 in our case, then the reaction will be 12, 12 times faster. Unfortunately, the answer is no, because the same the same isotope effect can be anticipated in the case of, of the reaction in, in the in aqueous solution. 
So it's of course great challenge to experimentally prove or disprove this for the enzymes where this might be uh, essential. So kinetic isotope effect for most of the normal enzymes is in the range between three and eight. Of, may, you might know that exception is like oxygenase where it's 80. So, but generated enzymes would work on average five times slower. Those who know some organic chemistry would uh, realize if one would be slowly drinking uh, heavy water, you know, and then uh, slowly all uh, deuterons, all protons in human body would be replaced by deuterons, and one would have slow and long life. So five times 80, so 400 years. This story works perfectly for Escherichia coli, but it does not work for higher organisms. Rodents do not survive if there is more than 30% of what uh, of D2O in their body. And of course, one can uh, speculate that uh, the concept of agonism and antagonism is gone. And as first step in this direction, we, we simulated what is the, how the quantum nature of, um, of the nuclear motion would affect just binding of ligands to the, hydro, to the histamine receptor. So that's again work of more or less of uh, Robert Vianello. He came with the, with the, with the, so initially we were thinking to proceed with path integration, but then we found this uh, neutron diffraction study where they stated that in the NHO hydrogen bonds, the ND distance shrinks 2.3 relative to the NH value, and then NO uh, distance elongates, and in hydrogen bonding community, they call this, uh, they call this, uh, um, effect. Uh, we consider this uh, this const as a constraint in in uh, in uh, quantum chemical calculations. We just scaled uh, uh, n d bonds and and and, uh, and o d bonds uh, for for with a factor uh, with a factor uh, zero point zero point ninety eight. So Robert came with this. Uh, complicated scheme since it's necessary to transfer histamine from aqueous solution to the receptor and we were basically able to, re to reproduce experimental change in, in the affinity. So we repeated the exercise with much larger uh, water environment and much larger part of the receptor and we basically came uh, with the with the experimental value, so for 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 um, progressively methylated his, um, histamine and to antagonists. Well, at the at the beginning, already in the in title, I promised that we are going to talk about neurodegeneration. Central nervous system weights two percent of the body mass, but still it consumes twenty percent of the oxygen. And clinically lost dead neurons are not replaced. That's more or less not. Huh? There are some exceptions. And clinically loss of neurons in central neural system is, manifest, man, is man, manifested as Alzheimer's dementia or Parkinson. And there are basically two, two mechanisms. We, and we also learned that monoamine oxidases produce hydrogen peroxide. So reactive reactive oxygen species can either attack fatty acids that are constituting the bilayer, so the membrane, and when membrane becomes leaky, then this is the end of, with, the, with the cell, or they are going to oxidize heavy metal ions like iron and copper, they bind alpha synuclein, and they press, this plaque is basically uh, is basically blocking the vesicular transporter. And neuron is progressing toward this homeostasis. It's, it's, uh, 
So MAO inhibition is, of course, an efficient strategy for prevention of neural degeneration. Together with, uh, with uh, Matitz Pavlin and uh, Matej Repic and Robert, we basically collected uh, kinetic data of all processes relevant for neural degeneration. And so this, this these, these reactions are waiting for awaiting for computational treatment. And side effect is when we are carefully searching the literature that monoamine oxidase is blocked by hormones if one is smoking cigarettes. So smoking is highly neuroprotective. So drinking red, red wine is also neuroprotective. So People in the tobacco industry, of course, love this research very much. <clears throat> well, uh, dopamine is beside MAOB catalyzed decomposition also rapidly auto-oxidize. So the rate constant is 0.14 per second. And again, a side product, we have hydrogen peroxide. And this is clinical manifestation is Parkinson, and this this uh, damages of the dopaminergic neurons are initially located in the nigra striatal pathway. This is the part, this is this red part here that is resp responsible for, for movement. Uh, we suggest the mechanism of dopamine deco decomposition. So this is all, this is all uh, quantum chemical. Work so it's necessary. So pr the proposed mechanism is that OH minus ion in aqueous solution is attacking neutral dopamine, and this is the barrier. And these are the costs first for for the uh, th this here 9.9.50 I58 is the pK value of of dopamine, and this is the the second term is the energy necessary for dopamine uh, deprotonation. And the first, the second term here is, is, uh, is free energy cost required to produce uh, OH uh, ion, so hydroxide ion. And the idea is that the rate constant, so now we have analytical, 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 uh, analytical expression of the activation energy as a function of pH. And we see here at acidic pH reactive uh, dopamine is not react, is not reactive. If you go to the physiological value and higher, it becomes the, the this reaction becomes very, very fast. So this is this was published in Frontier Molecular Neuroscience two years ago. So so dopamine is stored in the acidic vesicles work can last for for weeks while if it is here then it starts to decompose okay uh like here so a large majority of the dopamine is stored in these vesicles and of course you can change this of course you can change this by modulating the the uh, of dopamine and vesicular transporters. You can do that if you want to be more happy than necessary. So you can play with those two, two transporters with cocaine and amphetamines. Cocaine is going to block only dopamine transporter and is leaving vesicular transporter intact. Why? while amphetamines are going to block also this monster here. So then I said, and message is that if you sniff cocaine, in terms of neurodegeneration, you are pretty safe. It's cardiovascular issues are, are the other story. I'm not going to address this here. While amphetamines are highly problematic. So we made a nice, nice model. So three differential equations. So 
experimental data of pharmacokinetics where, where dopamine and amphetamines were plugged in, you know, as uh, time dependent, dependent uh, opening and closing of this uh, valves. Huh? And uh, so messages here in the synaptic gap, so this is the measure of how much you're stoned if you sniff cocaine or you take, uh, or you take uh, your, your uh, amphetamines, you see the effect, but still for, um, for cocaine, the story usually ends in half an hour. While in the, while in the cyto cytosol is the measure of neurodegeneration, and you see that uh, basically it does not, cocaine does not have any effect on the elevated uh, level of, uh, of, uh, of do dopamine there, while amphetamines induce elevated levels, and this is a measure of neurodegeneration. At this point, I would like to mention that we had enormous problems to, to, to publish that because you can imagine that in a medical journal to say that uh, that cocaine is safe for neurodegeneration. Not a good message. So we have tools to understand the effect of point mutations in monoamine oxidases. So we are able to say which residues are contributing to uh, to, to to catalysis. And with this machinery, we are planning to proceed. Uh, with, so we have tools to proceed with clinical neuroscience. You know, genomic medicine is these days producing enormous amounts of data, and uh, there are also applications in neuropsychiatry, like Brunner syndrome. This is the Dutch study. Uh, so the idea of Brunner syndrome is that you have less active monoamine oxidase A, and already fetus is is uh, exposed to, to large, to high levels of serotonin plasticity of the brain which change and uh, you end with, with, uh, with uh, stupid and very aggressive patients at the very end. We would like to understand more serotonin and dopamine transporters. Uh, challenges for future is multi-scale simulation of G-protein coupled receptors that are uh, formally as allosterically controlled enzymes. And since we have this nice machinery to simulate the isotope effects, would be fine to, to properly understand uh, isotope effects catalyzed by, uh, so of the reactions catalyzed by cytochromes. And of course, this macroscopic mod model of the synapse is a challenge for future. So now we are at the end. I would like to end those fine people. Without them, definitely computational uh, biochemistry and neuroscience would not be on the same level. So at this point, I would like to thank you for your, for your careful listening. And uh, we have now time for questions and answers. Thank you very much, Janice. Very interesting. Um, so I know that we have, uh, at the very least, already one question um, that was asked during the presentation about EVB. Uh, are they free energy profiles or, poten or potential energy? Here we are definitely talking about free energy profiles since we are using thermodynamic perturbation to slowly move systems from reactants over the transition state to the products. So uh, as, uh, again, uh, we performed uh, we performed uh, um, we performed free energy perturbation of with 51 windows and uh, results start to converge at one nanosecond. In, and in order to have a, uh, to estimate the error bar, we, we, uh, we perform 10 parallels starting from 10, 10, uh, from 10 different uh, uh, starting structures. 
uh, perhaps it would be useful for, 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 for the attendees if you can comment a little bit uh, in more detail about how you perform the free energy perturbation calculation in that case. So you want to go from reactant to product. So how, how, how do we do that? Okay. Yeah. As you know, as you know um, if you want to calculate free energy differences, it is necessary it is necessary uh, to, thermodynamic, to thermodynamically couple those two states. Uh, I remember early works of Hermann Berenson and Gerd Stratzma, they were mutating uh, sodium ion to neon. So it was, it was, uh, it was uh, alchemic uh, change. Here we are traveling from reactants to the, to the products by using this empirical valence bond, so gap between, uh, between, uh, between these two states is used as the reaction coordinate, the energy, and we monitor it. And basically, we are, we are, uh, we are uh, the point, the larger, the, the highest point on this pathway corresponds to the transition state. So you can, definitely uh, uh, take up uh, take out snapshots you can analyze you can you can um, you can uh, you can analyze uh, so it's uh, you, you obtain structural uh, information so if you want to if you want to obtain more information about that you can even perform ab initio qmm calculations for selected snapshots is that enough? I think so, yes. And maybe now it's so there's a couple of more questions which we forwarded to you. The last uh, question on the list is actually now a good one. So how do you then analyze uh, uh, your reaction in, in terms of which residues contribute to catalysis? That's a, a question of Jack Glancy. Okay, Jack Glancy. Maybe Jack. Touch more on how can determine the residues contributing to catalysis. That's relatively easy. So we take the snapshots and then we basically calculate interaction energy between, let's say, active site or quantum region and each individual residue that you can do. Huh? And you do it for the reactants and you do it for the transition state. And if, they, if the differences are significant, then those residues contribute to catalysis. It's, uh, uh, we have wonderful scripts for that. Alia Prach, that is probably attending this webinar, would, uh, would provide you with the, would provide you with the, with the, with the scripts. So all this work was done with, uh, what, what I was talking was mainly done by uh, Oquist uh, Q5, except those path integration that was done by Q6. Okay. That's great. Thank you very much. So, uh, the, so Jack, who asked this question, Jack, I will attempt to unmute you now, so that perhaps you can uh, follow up and and, and just uh, confirm whether that's um, whether that's answered your question, uh, or indeed follow up with with anything else you want to ask uh, ask Janice. Um, thank you very much for your talk, Professor Mavri. It was um, really, really um, insightful. Um, so I'll just I. Further to the question about determining which residues contribute to catalysis, um, clearly it's of importance and for quantum calculation speed to try and reduce how many how many residues we use. So when you say we calculate the interaction the energy between the transition states and the residues, do you how many of those residues do you initially include in the quantum region before when you find the transition state if that makes sense uh look when we were making this residue by residue contribution we considered full dimen dimensionality of the enzyme and you know we, we considered several several snapshots and this those snaps so since empirical valence bond is on the level of molecular mechanics we can afford we can afford several snapshots and we can we can uh, we can afford full dimensionality of the enzyme 
right, that cool. would make it more difficult with the Q with the ab initio QMMM. Still, uh, we uh, if you have structures, let's say snapshots of the, of the transition state and the reactants, uh, then you can we know that uh, the interaction between the transition state and the enzyme is more or less of electrostatic nature. So you can always consider the reactive subs subsystem if you want to analyze it properly. And you take uh, the, the enzyme is described on the level of atomic charges. So you can insert them that to your, to your ab initio calculation. That's, that's great. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go now to the question of, of Christina Rogatz. Considering the pH sensitivity of dopamine auto oxidation in solution shown by your is it MAO catalyzed metabolism or of also likely to, to be pH sensitive, especially gives, if it involves the proton transfer? Yes, it is. Um, very good point, uh, Christina. I uh, I probably have forgotten to to mention that the pH of dopamine is 9.4 or so, and uh, at physiological pH, or at pH at which the experiment was performed, it's, for, it's first necessary to remove the proton. And the reversible work for this is calculated as this 1.38 pH minus pK, and uh, this gives the strong pH dependence of the enzyme catalyzed reaction, as it was in the case of, of dopamine auto oxidation. That's right. Moreover, you know, pH dependence, uh, pH, if you would like to, to study this reaction at uh, some other pH values, uh, P, uh, protonation states of the ionizer residues may change. And the, then, then, then life becomes a little bit more complicated. That's not then it's not necessary. Then it's necessary to then it's necessary to uh, to redo the calculation with the since this changes the proton environment uh, the the proton environment. Uh, thanks very much. That was very insightful. Yes, my question was um, really considering if you deem it likely that some of the residues within the MAOs might actually change ionizable uh, properties with pH changes. And if that is realistic in a pH range, let's say between five and 10. I mean, it's, it's, it's perfectly possible to do it, but still, there are, there are, it's, it's not easy. Since the termination of, of pK values, of of uh, of the of the protein is far from being easy. I mean, we we calculated protonation states of the of the of the ionizable residues of both MAOA and MAOB, and um, still it's necessary to proceed with advanced uh, uh, with advanced uh, with advanced. Uh, methods that are only built in the worthless molaris. So currently Q does not support that. And uh, I was trying to understand how these things work properly, but Worshall actually implemented uh, Langevin, Langevin dipoles with uh, double grid resolution. So it's really, really, really complicated. So, uh, uh, one possibility is always to proceed with pro PKA uh, that gives reasonable values, and most of the computation enzymologists are using that these days. But okay. again, Q is not Q is not supporting currently PKA calculations, and I tried to persuade Johan Oquist and his team to implement that, but so far. Uh, this was not implemented yet. Okay. Thank you very much. In EVB, the reference reactions in water, which consideration should be taken into account to build the reaction model in water? How to select the atoms from the enzyme cofactors and substrate to build the model? All right. And we 
we considered dopamine or any other biogenic amine and the luniflavin flavin moiety. So this was there. This was the this was the model, and then was everything nicely solvated in a droplet of water. So we used about the same parameters for non-bonding interaction, especially this cutoff as in the enzyme re reaction. Uh, at this point, I would like to emphasize that it is essential to have the same orientation. So the same Euler angles in enzyme and in solution. So in reality, we perform first the simulation in the in the in the enzyme, and then we keep these orientations and and we 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 solvate we solvate the reactive system with 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 water. When you are when you are, when we are doing this reaction, we must have the same mechanism. And this really means that you have to apply soft position restraints for this, at least for this reactive center, in order, at least for the substrate and lumiflavin, in order, because in computation enzymology there is a big problem of uh, that we cannot simultaneously simulate chemical and conformational coordinates, since correlation times become very, very long. So. People that are doing ab initio QMMM enzymology usually do not have such troubles because in 50 picoseconds they can they can usually simulate, not much happens. Okay, is is that about? Yeah, it, it's pretty pretty clear the, the 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 response. So yeah, I was thinking in, in, in reactions where uh, some amino acids from the protein can can, can or to participate in the reaction. So I think that you need to, as you mentioned, uh, put constraints, soft constraints on the on those amino acids to 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 avoid the the the, the rupture of the of the catalytic uh, site. So it's clear uh, uh, your 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 answer. So thank you very much and very nice talk. Thank you. Now comes Mohammed Assad. Hi. The question was for the catalysis, is there any role of polarization energy? Could you please comment on it? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's make clear that the protein and water are used by using effectively polarized forces. So the charges or charge distribution does not change in during the reaction. Well, empirical valence bond part is, however, polarizable. So because all point charges, all, all point charges, or uh, by which is described either aqueous or enzyme environment, are included in the Hamilton. And this is a big difference between this empirical valence bond approach to simulate reactions and uh, and uh, previous attempts, let's say, by Bill Jorgensen, who was, you know, you probably remember from from textbooks when he was simulating the SN2 reaction, where the charges of the of this methyl chloride and chloride ion uh, did not change. Uh, with the fluctuations of water around them. So, uh, so for now, we have effectively polarized environment while reactive subsystem is polarized. Is that enough? Thank you very much. And it was a really wonderful presentation. Joe? Sure. As Professor Maori simulated the aqueous solution, uh, the aqueous reaction PCM and the explicit re representation of the solvent. If so, has he noticed any difference? Well, this reaction, we actually, at least Robert Vianello was, when he was doing cluster model, he was using this polarizable continuum model of that. But when it came to, re to real catalysis that I was discussing about what was the catalytic effect of monoamine oxidases, we had explicit solvent rounds. So it was the, 
it was again a nice uh, a nice bowl filled with with water and a reactive subsystem consisting of uh, of lumiflavin and uh, and uh, dopamine was sitting in the center so it was difference and of course uh, explicit representation of solvent is necessary if you want to have to have quantitative if you want to have quantitative uh, uh, measure of of the catalytic effect that's that's great thank you um professor Mavery. uh it's we've just been running some calculations on our own aqueous uh, reactions and have noticed quite a large difference when you calculate them in pcm and um, explicit solvation models in terms of explicit favoring charge separated species much more than the PCM solvation models. So that's all I was wondering, but thank you very much. Thank you. I can ask yeah, one more ahead. question. Please. I don't see other ones coming in. Yeah, sure. So when you compare, so it, the point about having to compare to solution is, is, a, is a very important one. Yeah, many QM studies indeed do not consider that. They only look at the enzyme and then they check if something is optimized or not by checking if the barrier goes down. But actually what happens is that they actually un, they actually change the, the binding free energy. That is something that I did not see in your talks. Do you also consider the binding free energy of the substrate into the protein. So that part of, this, of the reaction profile. And furthermore, does the free energy of the reaction between the free energy difference between the product and the and the reactants, does that match experiments? Because you seem to compare mostly on, on, on rate limiting steps. Okay, good question. So uh, uh, we did not consider the entrance of the of the substrate from aqueous solution to the to the to the uh, to the active site. So this formation of the Michaelis complex was not considered, since this controls the overall rate constant only in the case when chemistry is that fast that the that uh, that the reaction activation energy is lower than 5.2 kcal per mole. So this would be relevant, let's say, for very fast enzymes like acetylcholine okay. esterase or catalase or stuff like that. Okay, so that means that in the solution you also start already with the encounter complex. Then, if it's uh, if it's not only molecular. Yeah, yeah, no. It, it, okay, uh, I yeah. mean, in the case of of aqueous solution, if you have that means we are talking. If you if you want to, if I understand properly, want to ask how was done in the reference reaction. Again, yes. we started with the with the with the configuration that was ready for the reaction, and then we simulated only the catalytic step. Mm -hmm. So this approaching of uh, of um, of uh, of the substrate and uh, you know it, it it's necessary to enter the the active site and uh, it's necessary to move a little bit the enzyme and so this is fast. It does not cost much. Again, this is uh, relevant only for very, very fast enzymes. I, I remember studies of acetylcholine esterase uh, where people were trying to figure out. Uh, uh, so they, if, if, if this really costs less than 5.2 kcal, and uh, this, for this slow enzymes like monamine ox oxidase, this, this is not relevant. Okay, and the other question, so the free energy of the reaction, do you consider that as well? Uh, 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 maybe I can, this one, huh? Okay. Uh, we calculated free energy of the reaction, but only for this catalytic step, since immediately for, you know, subsequent, so this is the rate limiting step, but uh, probably several steps follow, that is called uh, formation of peroxide, the re regeneration and so, so react, um, reaction reaction free uh, reaction free energy so this is this difference between reactant and the products and probably product is somewhere here is is um, at least for monamine oxidase is not there are no experimental data available okay for some enzymes they are and uh, for that it's possible to proceed but still, for this enzyme, for this enzyme, it would be fun to proceed also with uh, with consequent step that is called uh, 
regeneration, you know, molecular oxygen enters, hydrogen peroxide is formed, but that's a little bit nastier chemistry because we are talking about uh, uh, open shell systems and we all know that that's not easy. Okay, thanks, Janice. Okay, so I think that is that is all the questions we have. Uh, so I would like to thank you very much on behalf of BioXL and behalf of all the attendees uh, for this really interesting presentation. And also it was great to have uh, this question and answer uh, session at the end. Very, very useful. Um, before we end the webinar completely, I should just uh, show that we have another webinar coming up, um, namely uh, next week Tuesday. As part of the QMM Best Practice Workshop, we have uh, Professor Carmen Rovira from the University of Barcelona uh, giving a talk about um, application of uh, QMM MD approaches for uh, carbohydrate active enzymes. And the information is there available um, on the, at the link on the BioXL website. So with that, thank you uh, again very much, Professor Mavri, and um, thank you all the attendees as well. And I hope you have a good weekend. Thank you, and thank you for the questions.